Hi, welcome back to API Days Live Singapore. And I'm sure you're having a lot of fun with amazing sessions with all these speakers, along with uh, our sponsors and their engagements at the booth. So next we have Christoph, uh, CEO and co-founder from Provonix. And he will be sharing a very interesting session by the topic, democratizing developer experience. So over to you, Christoph. Um, I th thank, thank you for the introduction, Nijay. Uh, Nijay. I, um, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, so this is a topic that's very close to, to my heart um, because um, I, I, I myself, I'm not a developer. So I've been always in looking in this world, in the API world, um, I am now, it's now five years that I'm, I'm part of this community. And uh, I always keep looking at it from this perspective of like, how do we get more people involved? How do we make this available um, for even developers that are just getting started for people that are um, like I, I called, I used to call them with customers, I call them the uh, garage developers. So this talk is about some of the trends that I've seen out there uh, with our customers uh, building developer portals and uh, also looking a bit in the future and, and thinking about how can we um, take this API infrastructure that we're building as a community and make it something that is available to everybody. Um, uh, so that's the power of uh, these interfaces become something that is is not only for our, the privileged few developers uh, that are out there. And this is much closer than, than you think. Um, because if you're running um, an API program, like normally when I do this talks live, I would this would be the moment that I would ask a question like, so who here um, already has a developer portal? And who here, um, you know, what kind of audience are you serving? Because most of the time, and this has changed, um, it used to be worse, but still there's this preconception that developer portals are only for developers. And that's not true. Um, uh, we have seen through our work with our customers that uh, there's different audiences. And um, uh, like we, we you know, very short intermezzo. So we are, as far as we know, the only consultants in the world that's fully dedicated to developer portals. This is where this experience comes from. And um, uh, what we've seen working with a bunch of different industries is that there's some differences in the kind of audiences you're targeting with your dev portals, um, but there's also some general things. And one of the biggest ones is this one, is that developer, uh, like a developer portals and the documentation about your APIs needs to address not just developers, but also business audiences. This is one of the biggest, most basic ones. And um, I think that the, a couple of years ago, this was still fairly new. People were mostly doing um, like, you know, the Swagger UI, API reference docs only kind of thing. Uh, that has shifted. Um, still, we see that customers sometimes don't like that it's an aha moment. It's like, oh yeah, right. Like we need to also think about that. Um, because sometimes you, you you cannot predict what kind of developer is, is sitting in front of you um, or what kind of person is sitting in front of you evaluating your APIs. Uh, because in an enterprise world, that might be a, a business owner or product uh, owner or CTO or CIO that's looking at, you know, is this company, are we gonna be able to integrate with this company? Um, so you need to think about both sides of the coin. Um, but I think that there's even, even more changes coming on the horizon. I see um, as APIs become more wide, uh, widespread and more um, something that, that every company has, I think that this infrastructure that we have built and that we are building, because I think that's what we're doing. Um, um, basically, the way I see it is that uh, the API <clears throat> API connections that we're building is kind of like the nervous network um, in in um, in a, a human body, where uh, some APIs uh, are triggering muscles to execute things, and some are just sensing and gathering information. So, this nervous network that we're building throughout the world is uh, becoming bigger and bigger and becoming more powerful. And this power needs to be addressed uh, accessible to more people. Um, and I'll talk through some examples of this. Um, I think the first one is that there's different types of audiences uh, that you need to be able to address. 
Um, uh, we've been working on the Dev Portal maturity model, and in that model, um, we've we've um, yeah recognized three kind of chunks of maturity or three types of maturity that we're seeing uh, portals going for. First of all, of course, is developer experiences. How easy is it to use uh, APIs and, and to start using APIs? Um, second is um, like the business alignment. It's like how, um, you know, how well are your APIs supporting a business function and um um, how how well is it document how to uh, document it how to use your APIs for business functions, and then the third one is operational excellence. Is how easy is it to update your information? How easy is it to um, get access to APIs and things like that? And um, the the operational excellence is like how easy is it for your stakeholders to do what they need to do on your developer portal? And um, so if it's only very technical people that are able to uh, submit content on your portal, uh, you have a problem because then you're going to have a bottleneck, a technical bottleneck who needs to be translating from uh, marketeers and salespeople that are trying to get information onto your dev portal into uh, the code that is going to get onto your dev portal. Uh, so, and what, what we've seen is that, um, and this is a, an important thing to take away, is that uh, you need to address both technical and non-technical audiences, not just on the consumption level, but also on the authoring level. So dev portals are not only for developers. Okay. Some companies that have done this um, really well, I think, uh, is one, one example is ABN AMRO. It's a Dutch uh, bank, a really large Dutch bank. Um, and um, they're also a customer, but that's not why they're here. But I, I, I really like the way that they've um, explained what their APIs do. And they have both very, very good, very accessible documentation about, you know, what is this API for and how will you use it and so on. Uh, and also the technical documentation on the site. So they combine both of these uh, sites um, to, to create the experience for both developers and business audiences. Mm -hmm. Um, TomTom is another interesting example. <clears throat> if you go and look at their dev portal, they have um, a landing pages about different topics that really explain how to use APIs for different purposes. And then they also, again, have the technical documentation to go and execute an integration. And Visa is another one, another example, where you have um, more businessy, just you know, what is this for kind of information and then the technical documentation. So this this is like the, the, the business and, and technical thing. Um, but then there's there's another way um, that dev portals are differentiated. Um, and this is something that I only recently started to realize. There's different types of affordances. And what do I mean with that? Um, I used to think that developer portals mostly were about the four kind of ecosystems that you were trying to target. Um, the industry, the customer, the partner, and the internal ecosystems. Uh, so like, um, this is typically still what most of the time we see when we're first talking with customers is that they'll, they'll be talking about, we want to make a partner portal, or we want to make a customer portal, or we want to make an internal portal. The industry one is a, is a little bit less used. This, this is, by the way, um, a concept, these four uh, types, this is a concept that I got from Chet Kapoor from Apigee um, as part of Google Cloud. Um, and uh, and this this was this is the compass that I used for for a very long time to kind of understand like what kind of portal is a customer trying to build. And and this is also this is what customers normally already uh, what what API teams normally already realize themselves. But there's a there's another dimension to that, and this is this is something new that I start seeing, um, and it's it's still kind of on the horizon. It's not fully fleshed out yet, um, but I think this is something that we'll start seeing more and more uh, as as we go forward. And, um, practically, is that there's different types of developer portals, not just about who they're serving, but also about what kind of affordances, what kind of tools are they serving to those audiences. Um, one of the most common ideas until fairly recently, or maybe even still today, is that um, you know, what a company needs is an API marketplace. And an API marketplace 
is basically it's a centralized place where you bring all your APIs together to make them uh, discoverable and findable. And there's two, two different concepts. I, I have more about this in, in other talks that I've done. Um, but what this is what we've seen a lot of banks do is create this central API marketplaces where they bring all their all their interfaces together. It's kind of like an interface to the interfaces. What I'm stuck, but what I, but it's kind of interesting is that mm, uh, an API marketplace, uh, as I said already earlier, is is about discoverability and findability. Um, it's kind of like an index, or it's kind of like uh, the Yahoo of the of the or of the old internet. It's it's like a central place where you can find all all the interfaces. Um, but you have to kind of like find your way around. So you have to think a lot about how are you going to structure this? Uh, what are going to be the sub pages? Um, like making just a flat list uh, will not really work. I, and I think that what most people are doing today is making this flat list of lots of APIs. Um, and I think that um, this is kind of a waste of the opportunity because there's different uh, there's different purposes that you can fulfill with APIs, and if you if you don't adopt uh, your um, developer portal to those di different interface or uh, different purposes, um, it won't really be able to fulfill that function as good as you normally would want it to fulfill. Um, practically, uh, the way I look at it, you have uh, ecosystems, uh, ecosystem dev portals. Those are dev portals where you bring together people to get them to interact with each other uh, through APIs and to like share information about how to become part of that ecosystem. You have platforms. Platforms are um, highly are uh, uh, places where you take a couple of APIs that are um, made to fulfill a, a fairly complex job through a much simplified, uh, much more simplified interface. Like for example, global payments, uh, like doing payments globally or doing um, SMSs globally. Those are complex things because you have to interact with all these different providers. Um, and platforms make that simpler by creating sort of aggregator API for them. I have apps and integrations. You might say like integrations really, is that like, you know, applications are those the developer things? And you, you know, here's where the lines start blurring. Apps and integrations, the way I see it, they also help you, they also help people to build connections between something that they're building themselves and the information infrastructure that's um, that's available in your company. Um, so, and, and because of that, I think that they, they deserve a place on your developer portal. Um, you have market edges, which are uh, portals that are trying to solve a very specific problem space or a regulatory problem space, like um, uh, like a European banking portal or um, a specific comp uh, uh, country's insurance uh, developer portal or things like that. And then procurement portals, um, uh, portals where uh, your vendors can publish their APIs that then are consumed to decide, for example, what product to buy from what company uh, at what point, uh, to do this in an automatic way. So these, these are different types of portals that I think are evolving on top or in parallel with these internal partner and external uh, types. So what I want to talk a little bit more about is this apps and integrations, because um, most of the others are really still for developers, but this fourth one is is kind of a weird one, and um, and I think this ties in really well with the low no code uh, kind of movement. And low no code, yeah, it, it sometimes it feels it's a little bit like the semantic web. It's this big promise that takes a very long time to fulfill itself. Uh, there's some examples already out there. There's like the, the Zapier and the if this then that uh, of the world um, where uh, you you can use a visual interface to to create an integration. Um, but it's it's still, yeah. I At the same time, um, I think there's a huge promise that this holds um, because uh, this this infra infrastructure, this information infrastructure, should not be something that um, you know. The easier we can make to use, make it to use this infrastructure, um, the more benefits we will see from it. It's kind of like um, going from the rail network 
in the 18th century, uh, where, um, where is it 18? Well, going from the rail network, where you needed to be um, like a, like you needed to be a big company to be able to use it, um, to the automobile uh, uh, road network uh, that we have today, where anybody can just step in their car and start using uh, this infrastructure. I think this is the shift that is coming and that we need to prepare for and we need to try to be part of uh, as the API community. Um, and the way, like the thing that triggered me to think about this was um, the developer portal of this company. KBC is a Belgian bank and they have this weird thing on their dev portal, uh, which are basically, they call it business solutions. And um, they're not APIs at all. They're uh, QR codes or widgets. And uh, basically what they're doing is that they're taking their API interface and they're um, making, or they're, they're taking this automated interface and they make it available to non-technical people. Uh, because a small business owner can um, go to the dev portal um, and like create their own QR codes that then can trigger a journey for their customers um, uh, that, that is connected to the journey that they're having uh, with, with this merchant. And it's I think it's fascinating um, because th this is like demo really democratizing developer experience, making it available for, for non-technical people. Um, there's a centralized experience. I already mentioned Zapier earlier, where um, a bunch of different tools, um, like there's a, a common interface where you can create the connections between a whole bunch of different tools. Um, this is also like for like SMEs uh, that that's don't necessarily have a developer available. And then you also have like the decentralized experience with um, uh, like a, this the studio that Twilio's launched uh, that allows you to like pipe together um, different different application like an application uh, in a sense. So these these are all experiments um, that I think are pointing in the same direction. Postman is doing something similar. Um, I think what's interesting with Postman, I had this discussion uh, also on our on our podcast, uh, API Resilience. Um, uh, we just recorded um, an interview with Kin Lane, uh, who's now a def uh, developer relations uh, for uh, Postman. And he talked about how he's seeing even analysts, people that are really non-technical, to start using uh, APIs uh, through Postman collections. So they'll, they'll use a Postman collection to uh, get information in a CSV uh, format out of an API that they can then use to build a financial report or something like that. Um, and uh, another example, uh, this, this was mentioned to us uh, by Lorna Jane, also on our podcast. Uh, this is something that uh, they're using at Vonage, which used to be called Nexmo, um, uh, which is Node-RED, Node which is also a tool for, for doing this uh, low no-code uh, kind of application building without really having to be a, a hardcore developer. So I think what we're getting to is like, this is, this is about... Um, again, this democratization, taking these interfaces that were only available for developers and making it easier and easier for more people to join it. Um, uh, and, and, you know, what does this mean for uh, developer relations? What does it mean for developer experience? What does it mean for um, how we're interacting with these people? I think that we still need to figure out exactly what is this. Um, is it, I, 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 I meant, like I asked Mehdi, also on our podcast, um, if uh, if maybe this is like integrations, like no, 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 don't use integrations. Yes, you are back. Okay, um, where did you where did I drop? So I think it was uh, when you're talking about the developers community. I think. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, so so I think it was this slide then, uh, and and it's just one more minute, and then I'm done. Um, so. Um, I think that to really reach the full potential of this API infrastructure that we've built, um, we need to make it available to everybody or almost everybody. And, uh, and, and this is going to create a lot of value for our community because basically um, we're going to go from an audience of uh, like 10 million to an audience of maybe a billion or a couple of billions. And... Um, uh, this potential is humongous. 
Um, but we'll have to figure out like how do we talk about that and and uh, what is this new thing uh, and and how do we uh, and how does it connect still to the API world and how do we bridge over uh, towards this new um, uh, new kind of, of of thinking about it and that's uh that's the end uh, so if you if you want to hear more of this uh, kind of content uh, we're having um, I think it's weekly or biweekly episodes I, I need to check with the colleagues. Um, we're recording them faster. That's why I'm not sure. Um, on API resilience, it's on Spotify and on Apple um, Apple iTunes. Um, so have have a, have a listen um, and and you know for for more discussions about this topic. And um, yeah, also if you want more information about developer portals, just uh, check out our newsletter. That's all. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christoph. And uh, we have a couple of minutes uh, with respect to your session. First of all, I thoroughly enjoyed your session along with the audiences which we have. And one of the key things which I want to ask uh, specifically, since I also engage a lot in terms of community development. So what aspects around the DevRel role as a professional you have seen would have been emerging uh, with respect to the APIs and the other aspect of that, the same question is, which of the regions you think are uh, pioneering in this? Because we are seeing this development in pockets as of now, rather than more in terms of globally. So if you can share some aspects around it from your own experience, I think it will be really good for the audience. So I'll start with the last question, and I'll ask you to rephrase the, the first one. Um, yeah. The um, so I don't, so the reason why I'm here doing this presentation, now first, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, to an audience in, in Singapore. Um, uh, the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm trying to understand better what is going on globally. Um, I have a, a fairly good feel about the European and the North American market. And I have seen this pockets, like the, the exact same thing that you're describing. I've seen this happening in Europe where uh, some countries might be just like a lot faster than others, but I don't have firsthand experience on um, on, on the global market on this, uh, just North America and Europe. But uh, ask me again in, in a couple of years and, and I'll have a better answer. Right. Absolutely. And the first question was around DevRel as a role. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. think there is a standard aspects of a DevRel role or is it more like a DevOps engineer, which is still not very much standardized as of now? So there's a whole community doing DevRel, yeah. and it's um, the converse like they're having discussions. I, I did a, a very similar talk uh, like this one at, for for DevRelCon uh, Earth, which is a, a conference series about de developer relations. Mm. Yeah. Um, the the interesting thing there is that like they're having these discussions: is are we developer marketing or what are we? <laughs> and <clears throat> And it's, I think the reason why it feels different is that um, DevRel requires you to be authentic and to be, you know, the, the standard way of doing marketing, which was a lot about creating emotions and creating needs, like art, sometimes artificially creating needs, um, and to some extent, a form of manipulation. Um, or, or sometimes like making yourself appear bigger than you are does not work with developers because uh, developers go to your dev portal and you're if you're saying that it takes five seconds to make an integration and it takes a month they're <laughs> they're not going to really trust you anymore <laughs> and and they're going to walk away and I think this is this um, I think it's a combination of the need for more authenticity um, in developer marketing or in in marketing. And um, a fairly technical, high technical level that you need to be able to do developer marketing, so to really understand what the audience's needs are, and, um, and and to really to be able to interact with them. And it's this combination of these two that I think makes DevRel something special. But it's it's similar to to what I was just describing. Like, um, where are the boundaries? It's not very clear, um, and you can. Um, you can talk about DevRel and a very specific developer advocate role, and and there's um, there's some patterns that you can follow uh, globally for that. But I, th I think it's um, yeah. I if you look at who DevRel people 
uh, report to in a business, you'll see that um, there's a few very exceptional companies where there's like a, a VP of DevRel or something similar. But most of the time, DevRel will be, will be reporting either into product, marketing, or sales, uh, depending on what role the APIs fulfill in, in, in an organization. Um, and then, yeah, what is the right way to do it? I, I'm not sure. I guess it depends on the business. Uh, if you're an API-first company and, and your business is all about selling APIs, uh, then probably DevRel is, is like its own thing. Um, if you're um, a bank, then maybe this is a, like a, a certain uh, market channel. So it de depends a little bit on, on the organization, I would say. Right. And thank you so much, Christoph. And I'm sure that it will be really helpful for many of the professionals because DevRel is certainly an evolving and emerging role. And these kind of insights really help. So thank you so much again mm -hmm. for joining us uh, along with the great session which you did. Thank you. Thank you for having me.